Tonight, desperation in Gaza as Israeli tanks and troops move in. People in Gaza have reached the breaking point. Aid centers looted, a major hospital told to evacuate, the communication blackout only now lifting as Israeli soldiers edge further into Gaza. They're now in. I think they're going to stay in. We break down Israel's expanding ground offensive. Shock and grief over Matthew Perry's sudden death. We're still in disbelief. It's sad. He was so young. And the candid interview less than a year ago about addiction and how he wanted to be remembered. Canadian Tire said this used car was safe to drive, then the engine died. What's the point of the inspection? A go public investigation into vehicle safety checks. What's not inspected may surprise you. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Israel's tanks and troops are pushing into Gaza tonight as its war with Hamas enters a difficult and dangerous new phase. Israel's military says it's launched hundreds of airstrikes in the past 24 hours as forces on the ground advanced. Communications within Gaza gradually coming back online to show some of the misery. Gaza's Hamas-controlled health ministry claims 8,000 people have been killed. And as Susan Ormiston shows us, in Gaza, desperation is driving what the UN calls a breakdown in civil order. The weekend, the war changed. 48 hours of the heaviest bombardment on Gaza yet, and another warning more urgent than the last to people in northern Gaza, go south. There's no talk anymore of when the ground incursion will come. It's here. The Israeli military confirming it's expanding its ground operations inside Gaza, sending in more troops, tanks and armor, and fighter jets hitting more than 450 targets over the past day. Benjamin Netanyahu says that his country is in the second phase of this war and predicted over the weekend that Gaza will never return to what it was. Gaza emerged from a two-night blackout, bloodied and desperate. Thousands stormed a UN warehouse storing food supplies, carrying off satchels of wheat flour and hygiene kits. After three weeks of near total isolation, the World Food Program says social order is beginning to break down. Sunday, one of the biggest hospitals, Al Quds, was ordered to evacuate immediately. The director said he was told the area was going to be a military zone and there would be clashes. With thousands taking shelter there, it was impossible. Multiple strikes did hit nearby, choking patients and damaging parts of the hospital. Israel claims vast tunnels under hospitals harbor Hamas and may hide the hostages they kidnapped. The more Israel hits Hamas, the defense minister said, the more it will be willing to reach agreement on releasing hostages. So far, that hasn't worked, and families of those missing are angry and even more fearful. Vivian Silver, a Canadian Israeli, is believed to be held in Gaza. Her son, Yonatan, is in Tel Aviv. You know, soldiers are not surgeons. They can't save one person from... Uh, it's, I don't think it works like that. From the side of Hamas, that they took the prisoners as leverage, and if they lose that leverage, then they don't have use for them anymore. So it seems to be to me that she is more at risk. Israel is settling into a long war, active here. And we are running to the shelter like a few times uh, every night. You cannot sleep. 20 kilometers from Gaza, volunteers coordinate food donations to augment soldiers' meals. You're there for us, we're there for you, the slogan says. And we are suffering from uh, missiles on our houses for more than 20 years. We've got to get uh, to the end. But few can predict how long or what will come after. Susan, we're entering the fourth week of this war as Israel pushes ahead on the ground. What other shifts are you looking for? Heading into week four, Ian, it's grim, but two things could drive the week. One is getting more of life's basic needs in through that crossing into southern Gaza from Egypt. The largest convoy yet came through today, nearly three dozen trucks, and there's signs that more relief may be on the way, and then the hostages. Hamas still holds that leverage. So what 
will Israel do to revive those negotiations? There is an immense pressure on the Israeli government on both those fronts. Susan Ormiston in Jerusalem again tonight. Hundreds of people stormed an airport in the Dagestan region of Russia in an apparent hunt for Jewish passengers arriving on a flight from Israel. Social media video showing people breaching the terminal and the tarmac, some waving Palestinian flags, and apparently checking passengers' passports. Local authorities say there were about 20 injuries, the airport now clear and closed to civilian traffic. Israel's ground operations in Gaza come amid ongoing strikes between, on the one side, U.S. and Israel, and on the other, Iranian-backed militias. As Peter Armstrong shows us, publicly, neither side wants an escalation, but no one seems to be backing down. A fresh barrage of rockets out of southern Lebanon. This one intercepted, but it's just the latest in a now daily exchange. Israel released video of an airstrike on what it called Hezbollah military infrastructure, all part of a pattern of violence that could explode into something bigger. In the occupied West Bank, there is seething anger as raids by the Israeli military and a surge of violence from Israeli settlers claims more Palestinian lives, adding to concerns the conflict could spread. Well, we believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu does have a responsibility to rein in the extremist settlers on the West Bank who are, as President Biden put it a few days ago, pouring fuel on the fire. Everybody wants to keep this from going sideways and would like to basically try and keep this contained to Gaza itself. Uh, rather than a broader regional conflict. The White House issued warnings this week to Iran about any attacks on U.S. troops in the Middle East. My warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond. In recent days, Iran's foreign minister has repeatedly lashed out at the U.S. and Israel. I warn if the genocide in Gaza continues, they will not be spared from this fire. The U.S. launched airstrikes on Iranian forces in Syria on Thursday. The Pentagon said that came after a recent surge in rocket attacks on U.S. bases there. Meanwhile, pressure from regional U.S. allies is also increasing. Turkey's president not exactly working to cool tensions. Netanyahu is a terrorist, he says, and promised to declare the Israeli prime minister a war criminal. Throughout this region, rallies, rhetoric and anger are soaring. As the death toll in Gaza rises, the task of containing this conflict gets harder every day. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Washington. Turning now to the sudden death of actor Matthew Perry. He died yesterday at his home in L.A. Tonight he's being remembered for his wit and honesty as he battled addiction. Philip Lee Shannock now with the legacy of the Friends star. I'm not great at the advice. Can I interest you in a sarcastic comment? Matthew Perry knew how to get a laugh. Straight-faced, self-deprecating, with perfect timing. I just want to be married again. <laughs> and I just want a million dollars. Perry was best known for playing the sarcastic but lovable Chandler Bing on the hit show Friends. For 10 seasons, he brought some of the funniest moments. He was the closer on Friends. If there was a zinger or a line or an eye roll, the cut they cut to him, and he delivered. On Saturday, he was found dead in his jacuzzi at his Los Angeles home. He was just 54. It's not clear how he died, but no foul play is suspected. Born in Massachusetts, Perry was raised in Ottawa. His mother was press secretary to Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He went to school with his son, Justin. The Prime Minister writing, I'll never forget the schoolyard games we used to play, and I know people around the world are never going to forget the joy he brought them. Thanks for all the laughs, Matthew. A day later, fans are still shocked. We were hoping it was um, not true. We're still in disbelief. It's sad. He was so young. I've managed to upset a mass murderer. Perry also starred in various film and television roles, but none achieved the level of success as Friends. <laughs> His Friends co-star, Maggie Wheeler, who played Janice, Chandler's sometimes girlfriend, writing, I feel so blessed by every creative moment we shared. Perry also battled addiction for most of his life. 
I mean, alcoholism did not care that I was on Friends. Speaking about his memoir released last year, he told the CBC's Tom Power that he hoped sharing his journey could help others. And when I die, I don't want Friends to be the first thing that's mentioned. I want that to be the first thing that's mentioned. For many, a beloved funny friend gone too young who will be deeply missed. Philip Lee Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up later in the show, we'll hear more of that Tom Power interview with Matthew Perry. If I could just say no. Your reaction tonight to the CBC News investigation into Buffy St. Marie's claims of Indigenous ancestry. The Indigenous Women's Collective is asking that St. Marie's 2018 Juno Award for Indigenous Album of the Year be rescinded. We believe that Buffy St. Marie engaged in a great deception regarding her origin story. This deception allowed her to benefit from a very deliberate and false narrative. The collective acknowledges that some will continue to support St. Marie after a Saskatchewan First Nation welcomed her in their community decades ago. The Fifth Estate investigation revealed information that contradicts St. Marie's claims to Indigenous ancestry, including her birth certificate, stating she was born in Massachusetts. A former NHL player is being remembered tonight after a shocking, fatal accident on the ice that's raising new questions about player safety, especially the use of neck guards. Jennifer Yoon explains what happened. And Adam Johnson, back for Aston Reese. Former Pittsburgh Penguin Adam Johnson played for the Nottingham Panthers in England's elite league until a tragic accident this weekend. During a Halloween-themed matchup, his neck was severely cut by a skate in a freak collision with another player in front of thousands of shocked fans, including kids. Uh, the players went straight to him, everything stopped. Two girls on their own in front of me were like going to the mum, you know, as he died and she couldn't really answer. Officials ended the game and cleared the arena, but medical personnel could not save Johnson's life. In a statement, the Panthers say the team is heartbroken and they're not the only ones, as the incident raises new questions about safety. It's obviously uh, hits, you know, real close to home for me because, you know, I, I almost died from the same accident. Former NHL player Clint Malarchuk suffered a similar injury when he played for the Buffalo Sabres back in 1989. Malarchuk says his mom saw it happen on live TV. And now he's thinking about what Johnson's family must be going through. I, I just can't uh, put it into words how it must be for them. You know, and, 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 you know, the kids from Minnesota, a big hockey state, and the whole, the whole hockey world's been affected by this, for sure. Others say this tragedy only highlights the importance of wearing protective equipment like neck guards, including this former junior player who also suffered a similar injury. I got about 25 stitches on the side of my cheek. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I keep saying that I'm lucky, but again, I think it was just because I was wearing a helmet and the proper equipment that uh, I needed at the time. In the NHL, some players choose to wear neck guards. We reached out to Hockey Canada, which says neck guards are mandatory for all players in minor hockey and in the women's league. Jennifer Yoon, CBC News, Montreal. Mexican officials say Hurricane Otis has now claimed the lives of at least 43 people in Acapulco, and with dozens still missing, that number is expected to rise. It's like a movie. It's like um, the apocalypse. It really is like the apocalypse. Survivors are struggling to get food and water and fuel, many of them lining up for hours in the hot sun. Otis slammed into the resort city as a Category 5 storm on Wednesday. Questions and concerns tonight over a Government of Alberta proposal to ditch the Canada Pension Plan and start its own. The provincial government is expected to start the process this week. J.P. Tasker has the reaction. There's confusion and uncertainty in Edmonton as the Alberta government threatens to pull out of the Canada Pension Plan. I'm still a Canadian, so I, I'm concerned that, you know, uh, other Canadians might be at a disadvantage. I'm not sure if we can handle we can like handle our own pension plan, so I'm, I'm anxious. <laughs> the province just launched an ad campaign to pitch skeptical Albertans, and it's making some big promises. These savings could be used to save Alberta workers up to $1,425 in payroll deductions every year. A report commissioned by the province says Alberta is entitled to more than half the CPP's $570 billion in assets. Money, it claims, could be used to slash contributions and boost pension payouts. 
does a population of four and a half million have to prop up every program in the country? Alberta's finance minister says the province has contributed more than its fair share, thanks to a younger and wealthier population. It doesn't leave CPP, you know, insolvent or inoperable. Ottawa is fighting back and blasting Alberta's math. Alberta might uh, not just uh, make uh, their own pensioners poorer by pulling out, but uh, impact Canadians from coast to coast. There are critics at home too. You think this idea is, is crazy? Hairbrained and crazy, yes. This Labour leader says Alberta is making a risky bet. We have a premier and a government that are willing to uh, use the retirement security of millions of Albertans as a, as a bargaining chip in some other political game uh, that they're trying to play with, the, with Ottawa. It's, it, it's, uh, it's completely outrageous and unacceptable. Despite the entrenched opposition, Alberta is pressing ahead. The government will introduce new legislation this week to get the ball rolling on a CPP exit. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. There is a tentative deal to end the St. Lawrence Seaway strike. The union said details of the contract will be shared with members before the public. 360 workers walked off the job more than a week ago over wages and working conditions. The strike shut down a key shipping route between the Great Lakes and the Atlantic. It will reopen on Monday. Now to a GoPublic investigation, the buyer of a used car thought she was protected when a Canadian Tire safety inspection said the vehicle was good to go. Except it wasn't, leaving her with a car too dangerous to drive. So she asked Rosa Marcatelli to look into it. Tara Harper thought she was in the clear. After all, this used SUV had passed a Canadian Tire safety inspection just before she bought it. So she handed over $5,000 to the private seller. On the way home, the engine died. I was really, really furious. The seller agreed to fix the engine on the 2007 Hyundai Santa Fe, but Harper was still nervous, wondering what other safety issues weren't covered in the Canadian Tire inspection. The longer you look, the more you find. She asked mechanic and family friend Todd Holmes to take a second look. And this is what he saw a severely corroded frame, what should have been an automatic fail for the inspection. You have a frame that disintegrates during an accident, it could cost them their lives. Some provinces require vehicles to pass safety inspections when ownership changes or every year or two. The garage that did Harper's was provincially certified, but that didn't help her. She says the seller and Canadian Tire just blamed each other. If the seller's not responsible and Canadian Tire is not responsible, what's the point of the inspection? See where the max is right here? Harper also wonders what the seller knew about the car. Go Public reached out to him repeatedly, but didn't hear back. Complaints should absolutely be followed up. An automobile consumer protection expert says car buyers may be surprised to learn that inspections often don't cover key parts of the vehicle, like the engine and transmission, and that the system lacks oversight. What you end up having is the illusion of protection when a government oversight program is not effective. Canadian Tire says the damage could have happened after the inspection, but mechanic Todd Holmes says that's not possible since the corrosion he found would take a lot longer than the couple of months that had passed. After Go Public's inquiries, two things happened. Canadian Tire reimbursed Harper for the $5,000 she paid for the vehicle as a goodwill gesture. And the province banned the Canadian Tire location from doing the mandatory inspections until August. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. A prominent artist is bringing her talents to Calgary. The pavilion is coming, coming up right over there. What she's designing and the vision behind it. Plus, cashing in on celebrity memoirs. In order for that book to be successful is to reveal something that your fans don't already know. Why so many A-listers are putting pen to paper. And breaking down the current phase in the Israel-Hamas war. They're now in, I think they're gonna stay in. Why some military experts say the worst is yet to come. We're back in two. A Calgary museum focusing on Western Canadian history and culture is getting a major facelift. 
with help from noted American designer Maya Lin. Her works have challenged imaginations around the world. And as Anise Sadari shows us, Canada's prairie cold is already challenging hers. It doesn't look like much yet. A pavilion is coming, coming up right over there. But this Calgary rooftop is set to transform with a famous American designer at the helm. Maya Lin designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Now she's taking on her first Canadian project, designing a new terrace at the Glenbow Museum. One of her goals, to represent the prairies in architecture. What I'm doing on the rooftop is welcoming you to the sky and the prairie as well. So hopefully you'll be able to connect to kind of the, the larger idea of where is Calgary situated in. Of course, visiting the site during winter also represents the prairies. Coming out here in the middle of winter, or it's actually the beginning of winter, helps really substantiate my goal to make something that is used physically in the warmer months, but is equally something that when you're inside the pavilion looking out or from the cafe, that you get to enjoy it as well. This project is part of a multi-million dollar investment. Lynn's work will help repurpose a 50-year-old building. Museum leaders say that was how they drew the designer in. We're taking old commercial and civic architecture and saying, let's make this new again, but without knocking it down. Let's find the value in that old building and refresh it so that it's a place that we want to spend time today. And those are the values that attracted her to Calgary. And I think you want to lead by example. So I think that the Glenbow committed to um, recycling, basically, their existing museum. Admission will be free to both the museum and the rooftop with both outdoor and indoor spaces. The projects should be done by 2026. Anis Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. Israel is now on the ground in Gaza, but they vow the full extent of the offensive is yet to come. Man on man in that, in those, uh, you know, in the streets, and uh, that's that's going to be the worst time of it all. The growing concerns about close quarter combat and Matthew Perry in his own words. The best thing about me is I can help people. How he wanted to be remembered about one year before his death. But first, books by celebrities are on the rise. There are these slam dunks. And writers are reaping the benefits. I am almost exclusively working on the memoirs all the time. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Montreal's Felix Auger-Aliassim has defended his Swiss indoors title. It took him less than two hours to beat Hubert Hurkacz of Poland. Matthew Perry wrote about his battles with addictions. Prince Harry's bestseller exposed the inner workings of the royal family. And Britney Spears' new book is full of revelations. Eli Glasner explains why the celebrity memoir is having a moment. After a tumultuous time, Britney Spears is celebrating. Even before her new memoir was released, demand pushed it to the top of Amazon's bestseller list. And the competition on the shelf is fierce. The business of brand name biographies is booming. Publishers are taking fewer risks. And so because they're taking fewer risks, I think they're more likely to publish celebrity memoirs because there are these slam dunks in their opinion. Putting ghostwriters in high demand. I would say it, it definitely had an uptick in the last couple of years, for sure. Um, up to the point where I, I'm almost exclusively working on memoirs all the time. But there are some risks. For a lot of celebrities, that becomes a difficult choice. And it's, it is the choice to write memoir because what you have to do in order for that book to be successful is to reveal something that your fans don't already know. This is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The co-hosts of a memoir podcast aren't surprised about the appetite. And especially with the way stand culture has evolved, like people just want to know every single thing about people. Which piles on the pressure for authors. I love to work. It's the funnest part to me. For Spears, who spent much of her adult life under a conservatorship, a memoir provides a chance to speak for herself. But this author says for women, there's still a double standard. 
that they would talk about their pain and their trauma and all the kind of the trauma, the drama. And then when it comes to marketing. Women can spend pages and pages talking about their awards and their accomplishments, but still it always comes back to, you know, the sex, the scandal, the bombshell reveals. And that's certainly been the case for books from Spears and Jada Pinkett Smith. But with the current actor strike stretching on, it might not be a deterrent. I think they fill that lull with, well, now it's time to write the memoir. The next wave of books may already be underway. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Matthew Perry's fans are mourning his death. In a few minutes, we'll share a recent interview with Q. But first, experts weigh in as Israel intensifies its war on Hamas. This is The Breakdown. Israeli forces move into Gaza, but it doesn't appear to be the onslaught they have warned of. The Israelis have taken the more patient approach. Tonight, we piece together their strategy and ask what's happening to the people in Gaza. The bakeries are out of bread. Clean water has run out. Let's start with the Israeli advance. Here's Thomas Dagler to break down what they've done so far. Pushing into Gaza with tanks and heavy machinery, apparently holding territory. These are the few glimpses of what Israel calls an expanded ground operation and come from Israel's military itself. Officials have revealed little about their strategy, but since Israeli troops moved into Gaza, video released provides hints about the raids so far. The water in the distance suggests at least some Israeli forces are operating near the Mediterranean Sea in northern Gaza, with an unknown number of soldiers advancing on foot. They're now in. I think they're going to stay in. I think that each piece of terrain that they secure, they're going to make sure that Hamas can no longer use it to their advantage. All of it foreshadowed by seemingly endless airstrikes that pummeled Gaza and its people, turning buildings into rubble that's bound to become the site of fierce fighting. Israeli forces have hinted more urban targets will be taken out, and they blame their enemy. Hamas puts your life in danger by placing weapons and forces within civilians' area in Gaza, including schools, mosques, and hospitals. The IDF says it has started destroying that massive tunnel network, part of what it considers Hamas's terrorist infrastructure, like these supposed facilities under a hospital. On Sunday, the Israeli military said in 24 hours, it had struck more than 450 militant targets including what it describes as Hamas command centers, observation posts, and anti-tank missile launching positions. The Israelis have taken the more patient approach. I think some of that's from external pressure. Some of that is for attempts to find out where the hostages are. And some of that is for the Israelis to gain intelligence. Since Hamas's carnage three weeks ago, Israel has warned of a ground invasion, though this does not appear to be the full extent of it yet. There's going to have to come that point to where they have close quarters combat, man on man in that in those uh, you know in the streets, and uh, that's that's going to be the worst time of it all. Again, late Sunday, explosions and flares lit up Gaza's night sky. Whatever comes next could be even more brutal. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. As Israeli troops advance into Gaza, many Palestinians are caught in the middle, including Asia Mathkur a Gaza resident and Canadian citizen trapped in the enclave. She has been sending her family voice messages, updating them on the deteriorating situation. Here's Asia's latest message. We are now taking shelter to the, um, to a part of the house where it's not near any windows and not uh, near the side where they are targeting a house near us, just one house two houses apart from us, they, they just told them to evacuate it. So now we are taking, uh, we are taking, uh, oh my God. Honestly, I don't know what's left. Like, uh, what, 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 what is the world waiting for? What are Canadians waiting for, to be honest? Are, are they waiting for to hear about me? I'm dead with all my kids and my family and, oh, we're just added to the numbers. Like, what's going on? People honestly need to start moving. Everything is so scary. May Latif is Asia's sister-in-law and has been in close contact with her throughout the ordeal. Uh, May, it's nighttime now in Gaza. You received that message this morning. Have you heard from Asia since? 
Yeah, we heard from her. Um, everything is okay, okay-ish. And um, it was very scary in the morning when we received that message. She's been trying to document things um, that we can keep in case something happens to her. Um, and that message is very raw because she sent it right after a neighbor had received a phone call telling her that her home was going to be bombed. And usually when one home is bombed, the whole street is, and they didn't have enough time to go anywhere. So, and nowhere to actually really go. So um, that's when we received that message and approximately an hour, an hour, half later, we were told that nothing panned out um, and sort of how the situation's going, it's moment by moment. I spoke with her two weeks ago. She was still in Gaza City at that point, moving from house to house even then. Now she's gone south to the Egyptian border and the Israeli Defense Force says people will be safer if they're in the south of Gaza. Does she feel that she's any safer than she was in the north? Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, there is bombing that continues in the south, but it's less than um, in central city and north but they're still bombing. There's also very little resources there. Um, no hospitals really um, functioning. And the bakeries are out of bread. Water has, you know, clean water has run out. They have some source of water, not clean, and they also have to pace it. They're eating canned foods, also having to pace their intake of canned foods. So the situation in the South is horrible. and. Every day, you know, the messages that we get are messages of today might be the last day. Please remember us. Um, and then we tend to not ask much details. We just, you know, answer back with a message of hope. May, with all this despair, it's, it's easy for people to be hopeless and numb. But, but you'd like to end this with a, with a call to action. Tell me about that. Yeah, I'd like to ask our government officials to demand a ceasefire. Canadians have always pride themselves on being a peaceful democratic state. And I think it's the right time right now to show the world our values. Recently in the United Nations, they voted, 120 countries voted for a ceasefire and Canada abstained from that. And um, so I just wanna remind Canadians that our voices are powerful and I wanna continue to send this message that we all need to speak up for the people who can't speak for themselves contact our local MPs um, and keep doing whatever we can to help the people of, of Gaza and the people really who are struggling everywhere. It's a difficult time, I know, May. Thank you very much for uh, speaking with us. Coming up, Matthew Perry opens up about his highs and his lows. I then knew that it wasn't my fault, that it was, that. I wasn't weaker. His advice for anyone dealing with addiction in his final interview with the CBC. Look, the first time in my life, I'm in a real relationship, okay? I'm not gonna screw that up by, you know, telling the truth. In his final CBC interview, Matthew Perry was brutally honest about addiction and going to rehab. I kind of just imitated Michael Keaton the whole time. So I was like, what, do I have a problem with the <laughs> Al alcohol? The friend star told the host of Q, Tom Power, how he came to realize what's really important in life. Being famous wasn't it. As millions mourn his sudden death, we want to revisit that very raw interview. Here's some of the conversation. It's lovely to have you. I've been looking forward to this. Congratulations on the book. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. How's the, how's the process been of just talking about it? How have you it's found? been, you know, what it's all about is helping people. And I've heard already five stories of people that read the book and checked into treatment. Well, I thought what we could do is, is kind of start from the beginning. Um, uh, the, uh, have the, a drink? Should we just have a drink? Yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah, no, yeah, well, yeah, good idea. Um, the book is called Friends and uh, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. 
And the big terrible thing is, of course, your, your struggles with addiction over the years that you talk about in this book. Um, it's, a, it's a dark book, it's a real book, it's a, it's a very funny book, but again, um, there's, there's reality there and there's darkness there. And I want to start kind of where all that began, which is the first time you had a drink you write about. Yeah. You were 14 in the backyard, somewhere in Ontario, right? Ottawa. You were with a, a couple of buddies. What do you remember from that night? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, that was pretty heavy. I was with uh, my best friends, uh, the Murray brothers, and uh, we decided, we didn't know what we were doing, you know, and uh, they got some beers and I got a, a bottle of wine called Anwar's Baby Duck. <laughs> is the name of it. And I drank the entire bottle and lay in the ground and looked at the skies and just felt better than I ever had in my entire life. And I thought to myself, this is probably what normal people feel like all the time. For so long, I didn't know what was going on. I do now. Um, and that's why the best thing about me is I can um, help people if they ask me to. Um, yeah, I can. <laughs> Wonderful things have happened in my life. I'm incredibly grateful for all of them, but that's the ticket for me, is helping people on a large scale or helping you know one guy and seeing the light turn on and him understanding what is happening. The other thing, man, is I didn't want this and I didn't I didn't want to have this problem, you know. No. And. It's so cunning, baffling, and powerful, alcoholism and addiction. And, you know, a lot of people say, because the reason this book has done so well and been taken into the hearts of so many people is because everybody's starting to know or have addiction in their life. People have a brother or a sister or a yeah. grandfather or a close friend who has addiction in their life. And they need to know from the addict's point of view in this case, me, how horrible it is and how they're not weak. We're not weak. I'm a pretty strong, re resilient guy. But it has nothing to do with weakness. It's a disease that we have, and we don't know that we have it. And if somebody says, just stop, you know, you want to punch them in the face because <laughs> they don't know, you know. Nancy Reagan had this, Nancy, Nancy Reagan had this, slogan that said, just say no. Just say no, yeah. And you're like, well, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just say no, I wouldn't have to go to 9,000 AA meetings. I'd just be at home saying no all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How did Chandler change as the person playing with him starts to struggle with addiction more and more during the... He didn't change. What was changing was me. Um, I had a rule that I would never drink or do drugs while working because I had too much respect for the five people that I was working with. So I was never wasted when I was working. Also, it would totally turn off the timing and it would, it would, it would just be awful. But I did work extremely hungover. And, you know, at one point I was shaking so much that if I was gonna cross, if I was gonna go from the bookshelf to the table, I'd have to kind of quickly do it and put my hand on the table so I wouldn't shake. And, you know, it got, it got that bad. Years later, I was in a treatment center in a detox ward and I was coming off of many, many, many drugs and I picked up the Alcoholics Anonymous book for the first time in my life. And I read, Drinkers think they're drinking to escape, but what they're really doing is trying to get over a disease they don't know they have. It's actually, they say, they're trying to get over a mental disorder they don't know they have. And I went, that's me. I can't believe it. This book was written in 1939, and it's about me. It's about the guy who drove to the liquor store at quarter to two so he could drink alone. It's about all these habits. It's about why my reaction was different than the Murray's when we drank that day when I was 14. We were all 14. Um, it separated me from the normal man. So it was a great day on the one hand. 
But on the other hand, it meant one day at a time, I have to stop drinking forever. And I thought, well, this is the only way I've ever enjoyed anything in the 20th century. And I have to give it up or, you know, it's going to kill me. So I, I, I gave it up for a long period of time. The secrets are what kill us. As soon as I, I mean, it was pulled out of me by somebody the first time I admitted it. But I was taking 55 Viking a day. I weighed 128 pounds. I was on Friends getting watched by 30 million people. And that's why I can't watch the show, because I was like brutally thin. And um, being beaten down so badly by the disease. So I went to Hazelden. I went to my first rehab. I didn't really learn anything. I kind of just imitated Michael Keaton the whole time. So I was like, what, do I have a problem with the <laughs> alcohol? Um, and, I, and I was placed in some kind of spiritual guy's office, and we talked a little bit. And as we were done talking, he turned around, he, he, I, he turned me around and said, just remember, it's not your fault. And I went, what? He said, it's not your fault. And I went, say that again. It's not your fault. And I said, what do you mean it's not my fault? I'm the one who's doing it. What do you mean? And he explained addiction and alcohol to me, and he saved my life. Um, because I then knew that it wasn't my fault, that, it was, that I wasn't weaker. It wasn't my will that was screwed up. It was that I have this disease, and I need to get help. And... You know, the thing that always makes me cry, and I hope I, I hope I don't cry here, is that it's not fair. It's not, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. That I had to go through, that I had to go through this disease while the other five didn't. They got everything that I, that I got. But I, I had to fight this thing, and still have to fight this thing. So just to end this on a good note, there are people that will help you, and get their help, it doesn't go away. It never goes away. I love you too. I think, I think it helps us not to know each other. Yeah. <laughs> what are the dreams now? The dreams now, the best thing about me, bar none, is if somebody comes up to me and says, I can't stop drinking, can you help me? I can say yes and follow up and do it. That's the best thing. <laughs> and I've said this for a long time, when I die, I don't want friends to be the first thing that's mentioned. I want that to be the first thing that's mentioned. And I'm going to live the rest of my life proving that. So poignant and part of a much longer conversation. You can see the nearly hour-long interview online by heading to cbcradio.ca. Coming up, when pumpkins become a problem. They climbed onto the roof of my house they climbed onto my shed. They climbed over the fence into the neighbor's yard. The gardening accident turned Halloween high point in our moment. While timely, this collection of pumpkins wasn't planned for, and it's just a fraction of the overall harvest. Despite the surprise, Ontario resident Chris Paul Farias chose to nurture each and every sprout. The overflowing garden that followed is our moment. How am I going to contain 300 pumpkins? Looking good. I noticed little plants popping up where I had not planted anything, and they turned out to be the pumpkin plants from the seeds that I had composted last year. This is the first pumpkin. My mind immediately went into like, how can I like manage this? My pumpkins grew into the neighbor's tree. 
I found a TV antenna, like one of those old metal TV antennas that came in like four pieces of 10 foot tall each. And I put those around the yard so they could grow up. The pumpkins have reached the roof. And everyone's like, no, no, they'll ruin your house. Oh, wow. This is gonna be a great story, let's do it. Pumpkins, pumpkins, pumpkins. Overall, I had, I think, almost 300 pumpkins growing in my tiny little backyard. Oh, jeez, Louise. So what we decided to do was set up this display at a uh, childcare facility, and we read The Great Pumpkin, and they were so excited, and they all took a pumpkin home. I just compost them and have the same problem next year. I was thinking, what a great storyteller, what great video, but did you see the super? They are a content creator, so that is a fantastic Halloween-themed content. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. See you Friday.